Well, good afternoon and thank you for joining our webinar. I'm Jessica Groskoff, Extension Educator at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Today is a part of the Center for Ag Profitability's weekly webinar series, which usually happens every Thursday at noon central. A full schedule of our web a full schedule is on our website at cap.unl.edu. Today's webinar is a part of a series to help land seekers in Nebraska Extension's Land Link program. Land Link works to connect land seekers with landowners who are looking to find successors. Land seeker and land owner applications are open at cap.unl.edu backslash land link. Land seeker and land owner applicants are matched with the most compatible counterparts so that they can create mutually beneficial partnerships. Communication is key for success in all businesses, but especially when your employees and coworkers are your family members. Today, we will learn about managing family and business relationships with conflict resolution and productive communication. Presenting today, we are pleased to have Ashley Westerhold with us. Ashley is an extension area economist with the University of Idaho, based in Twin Falls, where she has worked since 2018 after earning both her bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Ashley, thanks for being here with us. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to be here. I um, hope everyone can see my PowerPoint presentation. And so today I will be discussing family and business relationships. So a little bit about me, um, I grew up actually in North Georgia, but I have family who are farming across the Midwest. Um, my dad is from York, Nebraska, and his father um, passed away when he was very young. And so they had to sell the farm to move into town so that my grandma could support the boys. But I still have family who is farming in Northern Illinois, uh, Iowa, and Nebraska. And so, yeah, I'm here today to talk about family and business relationships. So just here's me with my uncle. Uh, interesting fact about them is that they own two businesses. Uh, they are farmers and they're also electricians. The issue they are finding is no successors. Um, I am not an electrician. I should go back to school and become one. They seem to be making very good money. And so we don't have, we don't know what's going to happen with these um, businesses, but it's just something that's always in the back of my mind and trying to help my family along with producers across the country and in the two states that I love, Idaho and Nebraska. So I'm happy to be here today. And so I'm going to start out by talking about family business benefits and challenges, and then discuss about conflict resolution. So this is a picture from the HBO show Succession. I think that it shows all of the horror stories of working with family and just how difficult it can be in trying to understand those family dynamics, understanding what has happened in the past and trying to get through um, into the future of your business, into the future of this operation. So there are benefits to being a part of a family business. I think a lot of you know the benefits. However, I'm going to be talking about them a little bit today. So there's commitment and unified leadership. I'm going to state these and then dive into them further um, in the following slides. So commitment and unified leadership, stability, trust and authenticity, flexibility and versatility, vision and long-term goals, decreased cost and expenditures, and then next generation in June, in June, I can't say that word right now, but you have the next generation helping you come up with these big ideas. And so that's really great. So commitment and unified leadership when it comes to family business. Well, if you are a part of the family business, you probably grew up in the business. You understand the level of commitment and you believe in the core values of your business. You share the same vision and ideas as your parents, um, potentially about where you want this business to go. So if the vision is cohesive, it opens up more opportunities for business development and continued success. You all have the same goal. Therefore, you are working together to get that goal and reach it. So family disagreements do not impede process when there is a realized common goal. If there is conflict, which we will talk about, 
if you all have the same goals and vision in mind, then the conflict will still be passed and you are able to really um, achieve those goals. And so you don't have the burden of office politics. These are your family members. Um, these are not your office colleagues. And so you have to work through conflict probably even harder than if they were just colleagues. So I um, am from Nebraska. I went to the University of Nebraska. So I thought this was funny. We talk about stability. So as you can see here, Tom Osborne as a coach for a long period of time has a better percentage winning record than the last three coaches that we've had where they had short stints in Nebraska history. But you can see just how if uh, depending on the amount of time you are there, you have better success over time just based off of Nebraska coaching record. So I thought that was funny. Um, I hope you find it funny too. We love being self-deprecating as Nebraska football fans. So. so stability, family businesses can achieve, maintain and elevate um, the sense of business stability. Oh, sorry. In leadership and overall organization structure and culture. So family positions and seniority can determine and define the organization's leadership, making way for leadership longevity. If you have a leader for a lot longer, they are able to make it through different transitions. Um, they are able to achieve those goals. It also lends itself to having well-founded policies and they're delivered better if there's an overall stability to the organization. I do not think that we like onboarding bo a boss for us every couple of years and we've been in our job longer than people that we're working with or that are higher above us in these roles, where in family businesses, usually the patriarch or matriarch have been there for a lot longer, making it a stable business. Um, stable in the sense that you don't have a bunch of turnover and therefore it's just easier to move on and achieve those goals. So within family businesses, hopefully, uh, the benefit is having trust and authenticity. So trust is unique and very evident in most successful family businesses. With inherent trust among family members, the business's leadership can talk, discuss, and disagree more openly and freely. Because they are family, they are able to be them tr their true selves and speak the way that they believe um, and share their ideas to family members without necessarily feeling judged. Just because you are family, you have been doing that with each other for a very long time, hopefully, openly talking and just being who you are to the core. So trust creates a freer space for authenticity, resulting in better ideas. If you are not afraid of speaking these ideas out loud, or being afraid of being fired potentially because of your crazy ideas, um, you might lead to something really great um, for the business. So family businesses also allow for flexibility and versatility. So members of the same family are willing to take on several, several different roles and workloads to make sure that the company succeeds. Again, you have to have those common goals to know that if you are achieving those. Because of flexibility and willingness to give more than what is expected, it drives continued success and a better understanding of the industry. If you are working to better this business because you have such ties to it, then you are going to work harder and you are going to better the business because you are putting everything you have into it. This understanding can help family members formulate better ideas for the development of products and services that the company offers to its customers. Again, you're eat, live, eat and breathing the business. Therefore, you are going to develop ideas and better products or services or think of ways to differentiate or um, value added products because you know your customers and you're getting to know the customer base. So then you have vision and long-term goals. So you need to hit on business goals and have the company vision maybe change over time. 
Um, but this vision is a long-term vision instead of short-term when you're talking about family businesses. A long-term perspective can allow for creative decision-making and strategy development. If you are always thinking about the end game, you are going to make a lot of decisions more naturally to get to that end goal. Um, the focus is to utilize resources to project, projects that are received, not only to benefit the business in the present, but all the way into the future. You are not in a family business. You are not just thinking about yourself. You are thinking about your next generation as well, uh, which is a lot different than if you are in a role working with someone else. I don't care who's going to refill my position after I'm gone. Um, but you do care when it is a family business and you want that longevity. You want um, your kids to be able to have the opportunity to come into this business as you can. So decrease costs and expenditures um, for this. Family members are willing to contribute their own financial resources when starting new sub ventures for the business organization or when there are financial difficulties. So that means that you are your own investors and that can be a detriment or that can be a great opportunity for you, um, but it does lend itself well to the success of the business and your, this desire makes sure long-term success is inherent in the part owners. You do not have to present to shareholders. You are presenting to yourself and to the family. And therefore, this is a really interesting part about family business is that you are wanting to put your own money into it to grow, to be better, um, which then ties you to making it better and making sure that it is successful because it is your livelihood. So next generation ingenuity, there you go, I said the word. A family business can include the next generation of members in the business leadership, work, and knowledge, increasing its competitive edge over non-family businesses. Because you can incorporate multiple generations, you're coming in with a whole different mindset of all of these people at different age groups being able to tell you their ideas. And because it is family, again, we're talking about more open communication, letting ideas flow freely. Um, and therefore you might get some great new brainstorm ideas about um, how to take the business into this next generation. Family businesses have a convenient and fast transition of leadership within generations. So because of age, potentially it is quicker to identify successor into that next generation. Whereas in a traditional business model, it might have other factors that take it into place, which could be something to consider in a family business as well. Um, you do not have to give it to the next generation. You could skip a generation. Um, but just something to think about. Um, you can also maintain long-term business policies that are already in place or complete those goals successfully just because you have next generations coming in. And so the business, again, you're sharing visions, you're sharing goals. Therefore, the business policies could probably remain into place as you're changing generations, which would not be the case in a non-family business model. So those were some of the opportunities and some of the benefits of having a family business. But there are challenges. And so I found this quote, starting a business with brother either ends business or ends brotherhood. And I think a lot of us know that to be the case in some family situations. And we do not want that to happen. However, we need to recognize that there are issues um, or challenges that come in with family businesses. So um, there are three roles in family businesses. Um, so you have the business, the family, the personal. We have the family and the business, they overlap. And then the opportunities provided might not match with your skill set. You could have a limited career gro growth and you could have family issues that impede the progress of your business. And then a lot of family businesses often lack the formal business structure, which we will get into all of these topics. 
So there are three roles to an individual in a family business. You have your business role. What is your role in the business? But you also have your family role. Where do you fit in in the family? And then you have a personal role, which is what are your interests? What do you need um, to relax or refresh yourself? And then having a social life that is not within your family or within the family business. The problem is all these roles compete with each other. And I know that in farming families, it's hard to differentiate dad being a boss and dad being dad, especially when business is only talked at the dinner table. Um, and that can be a really big challenge to kind of get over is that if the parents are always in a boss role, then they are not maybe talking to their family members as family but as employees, which could lead to a lot of miscommunication or hard feelings. And so we will talk a little bit about that communication in a little bit, but the three roles of the individual in the family business is really something that we see a lot and that it's hard to differentiate the different hats. So family and business overlap. So family considerations affect many business decisions. So for example, a business expansion is justified as a son's interest in the business. If the son does not wanna come back to the business, dad cannot expand. That means that you are putting pressure on that son to come back into the business if you want to expand, um, but it is contingent on that relationship, that family relationship, but also coming into a business relationship. Business considerations may affect family decisions. For example, maybe you couldn't refinish your kitchen or remodel your kitchen or bathroom because someone needed a new truck on the farm or some other consideration. And so these are kind of difficult conversations. Again, you're investing in this family business. You're putting your own money into it. And sometimes that takes precedent over maybe finishing a kitchen remodel. Um, and so that tie of family and business and the overlap and then the money can lead to challenges and issues. Another thing is that in family businesses, we need to match the skills with the positions that are open. And I know farming, this is really difficult, farming and ranching. Um, a lot of people love the work, um, the grunt work, or love being able to do ride the tractor, harvest, um, do those kind of jobs when there's a need for someone who has an understanding in financial management, marketing, labor management. And so we're, we see that a lot of people come back in because they just love what they do and they want to be a part of the family farm or the family business because they love um, a specific type of work, and that might be the same skill set as another person who already is in that family business, where you would need to have people that are in the whole of the family business. So saying if you're better at record keeping or financial management, that hole needs to be filled instead of having two people with the same exact skill set and skill needs um, in two positions um, and sharing those duties in that one. So the strengths of younger siblings and the management of crops, machinery, or sales often duplicate the strengths that are already in the business. So that is how to say it better than how I was saying. So I just wanted to say that. So in family businesses, there is limited career growth. Um, your career grows when the business grows, but a capable young family member often joins a family business while his or her parents are in the middle of their careers. And then grandparents may still be playing a dominant role in the business. In this situation, reality is waiting 30 years for one sig one's first significant case of top management decision-making. So in this multi-generation farm and the people are living longer, you might have a 90-year-old who is still operating and owning and operating, then you have the son who could be 60, 60 own, or operating. And then you have a son in the 30s that want to come back to the family farm. 
So you do still have the three generations on the farm. The likelihood is that not only will has your dad been waiting for that 30 years to get it from grandpa, now you'll have to wait maybe another 30 years to get it from dad. And so that's just the reality of family business and um, could be a challenge or an issue. So other things are that family issues impede progress sometimes. So if there are chronic health problems, uh, significant weather issues, marital problems, economic difficulties, um, this could all impede the progress of the business because the family members are the ones that are running the business. And so if there are any family issues, it could impede the progress of the business um, because your workforce isn't there doing the job that needs to be done because they are taking care of other problems that could be happening. Um, whereas in an other work situation, maybe you went on long-term disability or short-term and maybe you got some time off. However, the time off in a family business means off of doing all the work. Um, so factors like these, um, the family has little, no control, but it affects the outcomes of plans and expectations when these things pop up and it affects the business. So uh, one of the big ones is the lack of business organization in family businesses. Uh, family members all often come into the business with vague job descriptions and maybe no job descriptions at all. Uh, maybe they don't have compensation packages and they are just placed within the business hierarchy. This could lead to kind of hard feelings, but not understanding your role into these positions. So confidence that everything will work out usually substitutes for careful discussion of the pros and cons for joining the business. So if you're coming back to the family farm and you think everything is going to work out, it did for the generation before me, instead of really measuring out the pros and cons of leaving a current job to go back to the farm, um, could be something that causes an issue later down the road. Growing up in the business or marrying into it can lead to the conclusion that not much can or will change. If your family has been doing the same things forever and that each generation follows the one that came before them, then you might in your mind think nothing will change in this business because we do the things that um, our dad did before us or our mom did before us. And if you're marrying into it, maybe you think, oh, it's not my actual family or it is not my blood relative. So I cannot have a say in these business decisions, um, which then makes you feel like you cannot change anything. Um, and that can lead to issues and challenges. So a lot of those issues, there are some things that can be done to overcome them. First, we talk about this, I think in every succession planning course or every business course for that matter, but you have to have goals in a mission, in a vision for the business. I know that here in Idaho, when we teach our farm business management courses and our farm succession planning courses, we like to tell people to align their goals with the next generation and just make sure that everyone is on the same page with the vision of the business. A big thing that can really overcome a lot of issues is just respect for one another in their roles in the business. So respecting that grandpa is still the owner and operator respecting his role in the business um, can lead to much better communication and understanding. Things that family businesses who are successful tend to do is invest time and resources into more effective communication. If that is enlisting um, a mediator or going to business courses together or just having family meetings that are family meetings, not business meetings, um, and you are having more effective communication, it seems to overcome a lot more issues. If you have clear expectations, so all generations have clear expectations of what the workload looks like, what the lifestyle looks like, 
and understanding what those are for each generation, it can overcome a lot of issues. Implementing position descriptions. So again, we talk about this in farm business classes, farm management classes. Having position descriptions is a very useful tool in the toolbox. Understanding what everyone does on the operation. Understanding that if an accident were to happen and that person was not there on the farm, what do they do on a daily basis? Position descriptions can change every year. So I know every year I have to rewrite my position description. It can be the same with your farm. I know that that's a lot of work. However, it really helps in the organization of the business. Um, additionally, additionally, nurture those family relationships outside of business interactions. Nurture your family relationships make them stronger so that when you're working together in your business setting, there are not these underlying issues that could be coming. And just make sure that you're treating family as family on family time and having family meetings that are family-based, not business-based. And then always have a plan in place in case working with family doesn't work out. Um, I known people that were able to fire children from the business. And so just having a plan in place could really help you in the stress of dealing with family issues in case something doesn't work out. So there is this quiz that I found, Ohio State University Extension. They had a bunch of information on uh, family business relationships. And so I, I think Jessica could, could send out my slides and I can send everyone my slides, but just this quiz I found to be very interesting where you and the people that are involved in the family business can rank um, these questions and then they're collected and shared at a family meeting and just interesting to hear the feedback of what you get from answering these questions anonymously and talking about it with each other. So uh, I'm not sure where I am on time, so I might have to skip this little click uh, or clip, but I think a lot of people watch The Office, so I think a lot of people would understand which clip I would be showing, which is the win-win-win with Michael Scott, um, and he talks about um, how to come to a compromise, but also let it be a win-win-win situation. Winning for you, winning for them, and then winning for everyone. And so usually it's a win-win, but he wanted it to be a win-win-win. And so we'll be talking about conflict resolution. And a lot of this information is um, are from mediation tools. And I was a train, I'm trained in mediation through Wyoming, so I know that's confusing. However, a lot of these concepts are what mediators are taught and how to then go forward in conflict resolution. So there are seven steps in conflict resolution. And um, so understand the conflict, communication with, communicate with the opposition, brainstorm possible uh, resolutions, choose the best one, use a third party mediator so you can always enlist a mediator, explore, explore alternatives, and then cope with stressful situations and pressure tactics. So we're going to be talking about conflict resolution. And so the first one is understand the conflict. So in family business, do we ever have a conflict? That was a joke, but I, I know that uh, right now I'm on a webinar, so I can't see smiling faces, but we know that conflict arises in any type of business. Um, I say it might happen more in family business, but that depends on your family. Um, but so understand the conflict. So clearly define your own position and interest in the conflict and to understand those of your opponent. So what are the interests? 
what are some possible outcomes from this conflict? How legitimate is this conflict? And what are your opposing, um, what is the opposition having as their interests? Interests play an important role into the better understanding of conflict. So groups usually waste time bargaining over positions instead of explaining what the interests of their position are. So explaining your why. Why are you in conflict? Why do you feel this way? Why is this something that is so personal for you? Why is this something you want to be addressed? Um, understand the conflict. And that is going to start you on the right foot. And there are tons of questions. Again, I can send you a lot of material, supplemental material on this. Um, but just understanding the conflict is the first step. Why are we in conflict? OK, so the next one, which is always the scariest part. So I can understand the conflict. But now you're telling me I need to communicate with the opposition. And yes, I understand that can be intimidating, but we will discuss that on number seven of these. Um, so how to communicate? Well, you have to listen. So I know that sounds really scary about listening to your parents sometimes or listening to your children, but that is how we understand why we are in conflict, is listening to each other. Let everyone participate who wants to participate in this conflict. So if this is might not be a one-to-one -one conflict, it could be a whole family issue. And therefore, let everyone participate who wants to participate in this discussion. Talk about your strong emotions. Why are you feeling so emotional about this conflict? what is going on in this argument or in this discussion that is pulling at those heartstrings, what is causing that to happen? But don't react to emotional outburst. So do not put down other people's feelings. Do not react poorly to someone having um, strong emotions about a topic or a subject. Be an active listener. So I don't know if how many of you have been trained in active listening? I know that during my mediation training, we were taught about rephrasing, reframing. So I think I heard you say this. And um, that way you they know that you are hearing what they are saying and you are able to repeat it back to them so that you can be an active listener. They really respect that you are listening and a lot of people just really enjoy hearing that you were listening and being an active listener. Speak about yourself, not the other party. Use I, I feel, I um, want, or I need, or just I speak on the I terms, not you did this, you are this, you, 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 you. Do I feel, I feel, feel this way because, and so speak about yourself and not the other party. If you are saying you, you're, um, maybe that person's already feeling blame or feeling um, pressure on them, and that's not going to get um, the conflict resolved in a healthy way or in a fast way. So be concrete, but flexible. Understand your position and why you believe in your position and be concrete, but also understand that you should have some flexibility when it comes to possible resolutions to this conflict. Avoid early judgments. So I know that a lot of people think about like stereotypes or thinking that the other party or the opposition has these reasons behind their um, argument. And that's not necessarily true. Don't tell the opposition, it's up to you to solve your own problems. Um, this is, when you're in conflict resolution and you're trying to understand conflict, it is supposed to be a mutual working through this together, working as a team. And when you're in a family business, there's nothing more important than that trust. 
in understanding that you are working together for that common goal. So work to find a solution for everyone and then find a way to make their decision easy. Find a way and find a solution that makes it easy for both of you to say, yes, I want to move forward. Yes, I find this to be the resolution to this conflict. I find this to be a good decision. Um, and therefore you can move forward in implementing the resolution. So brainstorm resolutions. Work on coming up with as many ideas as possible. Don't judge or criticize the ideas yet. That might prevent people from thinking creatively. Try to maximize your options for resolutions. Look for win-win solutions or compromises. Find a way to make their decision easy again. And then see people. So if you were in a mediation or say you are a part of a family business and you have a daughter or you have a sister and your dad do not get along. Well. If you were in that situation acting as a mediator or trying to be a part of this conflict resolution team, you can sit people side to side. And if you put on a wall in front of them, the problem and a blank piece of paper or a blank chalkboard, then because they're sitting side by side, they view that they're facing this issue together instead of facing each other like a head on headbutt. And so that is, Really some kind of ways to brainstorm resolutions is to make sure that everyone knows the common goals. And that's how it is in business too. Everyone should know the common goals and vision for this business. So then if once you come up with these ideas on how to kind of put this conflict to rest, the goal is to choose the best resolution. So to use both group skills and resources to get the best result for everyone. Which resolution gives both groups the most? Um, so how do you get that win-win again? And how do you get the most wins on both sides? And that resolution is probably the best one. And so just walking through these steps of coming up with good ideas on how to better the family business and try to beat these conflicts head on. So again, in this, in conflict resolution, you can use a mediator. And I am a trained mediator. I know that um, a lot of people are trained in also facilitation. And so you could have someone facilitate a talk. You could use just a third party, non-biased member. So you had a cousin who is not involved in the family business. Um, maybe they could serve as mediator for a family. But what a mediator gives you is that they set ground rules for you and your opponent to agree upon. They create an appropriate setting for the meetings. Instead of the meetings being at a kitchen table, um, say you're sitting down with mom or dad and you guys are fighting over if we should expand the business or not, um, they could maybe put you into a setting where you do not feel like you are the child in that situation, or if you are the parent in that situation, because that already creates power dynamics that you do not necessarily want when you're talking about finding a resolution to conflict. And so maybe you meet at the local library and you have that cousin or you have an extension staff or you have someone come and meet you and help you be that third party um, listen, listener and help um, run these kind of meetings. So if you also use a mediator, they could possibly suggest how to compromise, just hearing both sides of the story. They're an ear uh, for the anger and the fear. They listen and explain the positions to one another. So again, I was trained in rephrasing and reframing. So understand what each side is saying by taking out that emotion and saying, what is behind this? What is a goal for you? Finding the interest behind each side's position, looking for that win-win, keeping both parties focused. Um, so in conflict resolution, especially in families, it is really hard to keep parties focused. When I was five years old, you 
ran me over with the tractor. I guess that would be traumatic. Uh, but when I was five years old, you um, got to go with dad on the fishing trip and I didn't. If we talk about that during a meeting that is completely not about that, uh, we are going to get sidetracked. We are going to get more animosity and it's hard to do that without a mediator sometimes. We like to get off track. And so a mediator can help you focus, be reasonable and be respectful. Um, and then they can also help any party from feeling that they're losing face by being in front of a mediator or in front of the supposing team. And then writing the draft of your agreement with opposition. So a mediator could write a draft of what your resolution is moving forward. So then if you create all these things, you could explore alternatives. Um, you explore alternatives just in case there is no resolution that can be had. If you consider possible agreements with your opponent, compare them to the best alternative. If you do not know what the alternative is, you'll be negotiating without all necessary information. So if we do not come up with a resolution today, we will not be able to maybe buy that ground next to us because we cannot come up with a, an agreement right now. And so we might be losing the chance at something. And so that's the alternative. If we do not come up with something today, the alternative is we're going to lose the chance to do something else. So how do we cope with stressful situations? So all of these situations are stressful. And if you are in conflict, it's always stressful. And it's always, in, um, it's always hard on relationships when you are in conflict and you stay in conflict. So if you have also power dynamics, that can put extra pressure on you to make a quick decision in the opposition's favor, say you are um, in conflict with a parent in this situation. Well, because they are your parent and you respect them, maybe you move quickly into a decision, but it, it might not be the best decision for both of you. When a situation like a power dynamic comes into play, we need to stay calm and go slow. That way you are addressing all the issues on both sides and why the conflict is arise. The thing to avoid is try not to get angry or make a rush, rushed decision when you're in conflict. Instead, talk about why you feel pressure right now without being judged or without there being any judgment. So I feel pressure to agree with you, dad, because you are my dad. However, I think it will be detrimental to our business if you do not hear my ideas or if we do not buy that piece of ground next to us to expand. Um, so just some examples there. So conflict resolution summary. Again, I'm talking about this in like 15 minutes compared to my seven day mediation course of learning how to really tackle conflict. But the best solution is the solution for both sides. So when you are dealing with family, it is really difficult to understand both sides if you guys are not in communication with each other. Um, of course, you can't always find a win-win, but you should use all the resources you possibly can to solve your conflict as smoothly as you can. And with a win-win-win, we all win. And so I just want you guys to think about how you can better communicate with each other and try to work through some steps on how to get past the conflict instead of burying it deep for then when another conflict comes up, you talk about when you were five years old and dad picked your brother for a fishing trip instead of you. And that is impeding your conversation about succession planning when you were 45 years old um, because your brother was always the favorite. So that's just, again, um, a conversation and an example of how to kind of work through this and why it's important to work through conflicts as they come up, just because there will always be conflict, but you might be digging back and continuing to live in past conflict that was never addressed to then approach today's conflict or present conflict. 
And so that's why you should learn how to manage it and go through these steps. So um, one of the books that I think everyone should read, and I saw that Alan Vanalik is on here, and I think every person that ever negotiates or will ever negotiate or just works in a situation where you are maybe constantly in conflict or needing to make better decisions, uh, Getting to Yes, Negotiating Agreement Without Giving In is a great book and I would recommend to anyone who is interested in negotiation and especially negotiating with family members, um, which can be more emotionally charged than maybe non-family members. So um, just wanted to say thank you for having me. I can open this up for any discussion or chat. Um, I wanted to show you that this is my son. I do not have twins. Um, but why would you want to go into the family, the business with your family? Well, it's because you might want to see your family every day. And so this is my son at our two favorite schools in my two favorite states, um, his Husker outfit and then his Vandal outfit. So just wanted to throw my baby in there and why my I have bags under my eyes is because of this little guy. So with that, uh, thank you for having me. And I would love to hear your why. Do you wanna go into your family business if you are interested in discussing? But um, I understand I talked for 45 minutes. So yeah, thank you. So if you have a question for Ashley, we're going to hang on here. You can put them in the chat box or in the Q&A. So again, if you have a question for Ashley, you can stick it here in the chat box or the Q&A. So one of the things that Ashley mentioned was getting um, away from the kitchen table. And one of the things that I want to offer as a part of Nebraska Extension is you are always welcome to utilize one of our Nebraska Extension facilities to do so. So whether that's a local research center or a county office, I'm sure we have a boardroom somewhere um, that, that you can utilize to, to host those family meetings um, away from your home place. So again, we're gonna hold on here for just a minute, just in case there are any questions that you would like to ask Ashley. While you're thinking of those questions, I do want to invite you to the Returning to the Farm program. If you need help improving your family and business relationships, the Returning to the Farm program is designed to assist families develop a plan to create successful working arrangements that will meet the needs of multiple generations. The course will be held December 10th and 11th in Columbus, Nebraska with follow-up workshops January uh, 13th and February 10th. You can find out more information by following the link on the screen. So again, if you are a family that has multiple generations, we invite you to the Returning to the Farm event that is happening this winter. So one of the questions was, is it possible to get a copy of the slides? Of course, um, the slides and the recording of the webinar will be placed at cap.unl.edu. Um, probably tomorrow it will be up. Um, just a thank you to Ashley um, and our uh, uh, families working to realign some of their farming practices. Very helpful workshop. Well, thank you for that. Well, yeah, I bet, um, Jessica, you guys have worksheets, hopefully, to help with mission and vision, and I think every extension program does, and I think that if you are a farming family coming back, it would just be good to sit down with those generations and make sure that you are all on the same page for expectations, so great comment, and thank you, Jessica. All right, well. A recording of this webinar, again, will be posted at cap.unl.edu, where you can also register for other upcoming workshops. We hope that you will join us again next week at Thursday um, at noon as we look at the impact of price and management on culling decisions for cow-calf producers. Um, there will be a link in the chat box uh, for you to take a brief survey about today's webinar and inform us about our upcoming sessions. Thank you again for joining us.